Good morning, everyone. Uh, also, good afternoon and good evening for those of you who are tuning in. My name is Marsha Bernicat, and I'm the Director General of the Foreign Service and Director of Global Talent Management here at the Department of State. And I want to, on behalf of the 78,696 employees, more or less, to welcome you back home to the Department of State for this year's Foreign Affairs Day. It's the 59th year of a tradition that dates back to 1965, and we are so thrilled that you are here. And yes, we heard you, those of you who gave us feedback last year, and are so pleased to bring back the full slate of activities for this year's Foreign Affairs Day. Um, we have many activities lined up for you, and I hope you'll take advantage um, of the uh, various things that we have going on. Please join me at the top in thanking AFSA President Tom Yezgurdi, DACOR President Angela Dickey, and Executive Director Kyle Logden for their organization's generous support of this event throughout the years. As a foreign affairs community, we have faced so many challenges in recent years, including the pandemic. Yes, we're still talking about the pandemic. Afghanistan, Ukraine, most recently the Middle East, to name just a few. On, this very, on his very first day in office, Secretary Blinken, in an almost prescient way, made a commitment to modernize American diplomacy in order to tackle not only the challenges of the day, but also to be agile enough and ready enough to respond to challenges that we can't even imagine yet. This is a very special Foreign Affairs Day because this year also marks the 100th anniversary of the Rogers Act, the pivotal legislation that modernized the Foreign Service it for the 20th century. I want to make sure that you're aware that um, we are offering, um, the National Museum of American Diplomacy is offering tours this afternoon. Um, there's a modest display, but a really rich oral history um, that the historian is prepared to offer you about the Rogers Act. You will be as amazed as perhaps you are, um, maybe appalled is too strong a word, but the motivations behind the act were very mixed, um, but brought um, us to the fundamental goal or realization that has not changed. And that is to ensure that the Foreign Service um, that attracts the, uh, is able to attract the nation's best, and then to sort through all of those people that we attract to choose the best among them based on merit. The modernization agenda that Secretary Blinken has embarked upon during the course of his tenure is this generation's commitment to enhance the efficiency, the effectiveness, and the adaptability to meet contemporary challenges. The Bureau of Global Talent Management, HR, um, has as its priorities the heart of this agenda, and we are at the heart of the agenda. The three main goals of the modernization agenda are modernizing the organization, and there's an IT piece to that, there's a risk, um, increasing our tolerance for risk component of that, but also modernizing the structures under which we are organized. Secondly, to empower workforce agility in every sense that you can imagine. How do we stand up a reserve corps to bring in people to augment our existing staff when there are crises? How do we make sure that people can move around our organization freely, even as they develop expertise in particular areas? Um, and then how do we respond to all of the other crises that make up the daily living involved, but particularly um, in, in being deployed overseas, but also 
to include all of our civil service colleagues who provide the backbone of our work here as our locally employed staff pr provide the backbone of our work overseas. And then third, aspiring for greater accountability to make sure that we are not only doing right by the American people, but that we're doing right by one another. Our goals in GTM are to recruit, empower, and develop a premier diplomatic corps, and to create a more positive and conducive employee experience as we're doing so. Modernizing starts with getting the right people in the right place at the right time. And we're counting on you, all of you, to help us do just that. Since March of 2020, when our world was changed so dramatically by the pandemic and we went into quarantine, we have onboarded new hires at record levels, making up for hiring that did not occur during the last administration. But to give you a sense of how robust our hiring has been since March of 2020, um, nearly a quarter of our foreign ser service and a third of our civil service workforce have been hired since that date. We are a very young um, department at the moment in terms of seniority. Hiring will continue above attrition thanks to a rock solid commitment on the part of the secretary and other senior leaders in spite of the latest round of budget cuts. So my appeal to you all is help us keep both the Foreign Service and the Civil Service pipelines robust and full of good competitive people. And I want to assure you, we're not having any trouble attracting people to joining us. To further advance the Secretary's goals of modernizing American diplomacy and to win the competition for talent, and that competition in this low unemployment environment is especially fierce, we have made a number of new innovations to the Foreign Service selection process. For instance, beginning with candidates who took the Foreign Service Officer Test in February, the department is moving to a fully virtual Foreign Service Officer Assessment, what we used to call the ORALS. This change ends the requirement that candidates travel to participate in an in-person Foreign Service Officer Assessment. This significantly increases accessibility for our candidates. It eliminates travel costs and other opportunity costs um, that have been barriers in the past and other logistics burdens. It improves um, our assessor's ability to have multiple looks at candidates. Not everything is riding on a single day that may be your best day or your most nervous day in life. Um, they get to see the candidates um, fully. And thanks to live captioning and other um, uh, adaptive services, um, whether or not you have a disability does not create a barrier for you to participate in the test. And finally, um, in case you're worried about the virtual aspect of it, it also tests our candidates on their tech skills um, because in this, <laughs> not to mention some of us who are already here, <laughs> Um, but that those tech skills are actually integral to what we're doing now as, as a workforce. All of this has not compromised one iota, I want to assure you, the highly competitive selection process. We are recruiting for diversity of every kind, um, not just race, not just gender, not just disability, but also geographic. We're bringing folks to the department from all 50 states, every territory, and people who have lived overseas. We're bringing in people who are the firstborn or the youngest, bringing in people who are first generation Americans or people whose, whose families have been here for generations. We want all of that diversity added to our workforce. One other uh, innovation I'll talk about in January, the department announced a new targeted lateral entry program uh, nicknamed LEP, for mid-level entry into the Foreign Service. I want you to know we received over 3,000 applications for that program, and we are in the process of assessing 
the 100 finalists because they too must go through the Foreign Service Officer Assessment. It was mandated by Congress, the LEP program, back in FY 2017, just as we were going into a hiring freeze. But we designed LEP to meet the needs we have today, namely to recruit and hire a limited number of experts in areas critical to US foreign policy. And many of, that, uh, of those experts, that expertise, um, include things that are less traditional. Um, um, so people who are not necessarily, hadn't necessarily looked um, for a career in diplomacy. Um, these skills include emerging technology, health diplomacy, climate. Um, these are all critical areas that are central, not only to our diplomatic efforts these days, but to our national security and our prosperity. Of course, modernization um, involves not only recruitment and hiring, but also developing, training, and retaining that diverse workforce, and to make sure that they're equipped to meet the needs of the moment, as well as those we can hope to anticipate in support of US foreign policy goals. We believe that our, the best way to serve the American people is to be a truly representative workforce, as I just mentioned. Um, bless you. Uh, because it leverages our nation's greatest strength, our greatest comparative advantage in the world, the fact that we are the most diverse country in the world, and that that diversity, including, again, all of its characteristics, give us the best chance of not missing any nuance about the world in which we operate today and how the US needs to navigate in that world. So the challenges are many, um, but we are up to the task, I promise you. Not only because you helped train us um, and gave us the legacy on which we are building, um, but also because you have our backs in the work that you continue to do and the young people that you are influencing today to join our ranks. Secretary Blinken asked me to pass on his regrets that he cannot be here in person today. You can imagine why. Um, but he uh, wanted very much to speak to you. And so he recorded a message for this special occasion that we will now play. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this year's Foreign Affairs Day. I'm grateful to our friends at the American Foreign Service Association, the Dacor Bacon House Foundation, and the Senior Living Foundation for their partnership and for making this event possible. To the retired members of the Foreign Service and the Civil Service who are with us this morning, welcome home. We're so glad you're here. And every diplomat, development expert, and foreign affairs professional joining us today, thank you for your service. Whether you've worked at the State Department, USAID, the Foreign Agricultural Service, the Foreign Commercial Service, or the U.S. Agency for Global Media, you played an essential role in American diplomacy. You've represented the United States and nations across the globe. You've advanced our national security, created opportunities for American workers, businesses, entrepreneurs, fought for the rights of vulnerable communities, protected our shared planet. By making it possible for our people to study, work, and travel abroad, and helping citizens from other countries do the same in the United States, you built bonds between Americans and people around the world. Doing this often demanded a lot of you. Long hours, missing important moments with your families, being posted in places far from your community. Some of our colleagues also made the ultimate sacrifice in the line of duty. Today, every day, we remember and honor the courage and selflessness with which they serve the American people. I see that spirit of service every day across our foreign affairs agencies. I see it in the way that our workforce meets challenges with conviction and resolve. Going the extra mile to bring a crucial negotiation across the finish line. Overcoming countless obstacles to get critical aid to survivors of a natural disaster. Working tirelessly to free Americans wrongfully detained abroad. Organizing a diplomatic delegation that strengthened ties with a crucial partner. Ensuring our posts around the world can open their doors and do the work of diplomacy every single day. I also see a remarkable spirit of service across so many of your careers. 
As administrations have come and gone, alliances and partnerships have evolved, new technologies have rewired our lives, you've provided continuity, knowledge, and guidance that's helped our institution and our nation navigate an ever-changing world. So I've made it a priority to invest in our workforce, to make sure that everyone has the chance to develop new skills, grow their careers, use their talents to tackle threats and seize opportunities for our people. Because we may not be able to anticipate every challenge, but we know that we cannot meet them without diplomacy or without the leadership of our extraordinary diplomats, active and retired. Indeed, that's why Foreign Affairs Day was created nearly 60 years ago. In 1965, Secretary Rusk invited retired Foreign Service officers back to this building because he believed they were what he called a great national asset. He wanted to celebrate them, to encourage them to stay engaged, to keep drawing on their exceptional knowledge and experience. Now, a lot's changed since then. This event has grown to include the talents of both our civil service and our foreign service. This group has become more reflective of the country that we represent. And today, many of you can participate online, some from thousands of miles away. But one thing has stayed the same. You are a tremendous national asset. So many of you are still serving, volunteering in your communities to make them greener, sharing your regional expertise with this department, or teaching and mentoring the next generation of public servants. However you choose to stay involved, you continue to make our country and our world better through your service. Thank you, and have a great Foreign Affairs Day. I should have mentioned as well that um, the number of reforms that we have uh, undertaking, and we've undertaken or we are undertaking include um, greater agility and professional development for our civil service, including the first ever civil service training float, um, and reforms to the way we set wages for our locally employed staff. If you're like me, um, for years we've been frustrated by the methodologies that were used. And we're also making great strides in the way we hire and compensate our um, family members, because again, they bring enormous talents and skills um, to our mission as well. Now I'd like to invite Angela Dickey, president of Dakar and the Dakar Bacon House Foundation to the podium to award the annual Dakar Foreign Service Cup. Angela, thank you so much for the role that Dakar plays in being our home away from home. Thank you so much, Ambassador Marsha, for having all of us back here today. I'm Angela Dickey, the president of DACOR and DACOR Bacon House Foundation. As many of you know, DACOR is located between here and the White House, um, and it's in a 200-year-old residence, one of the oldest in Washington, the oldest brick residences in Washington. Our mission at DACOR and the Foundation is to support the U.S. Foreign Service, diplomacy, public understanding of diplomacy, and preserve our, our house. That house has provided hospitality and community for the Foreign Service and the wider foreign affairs community since 1985. And since about 10 years ago, DACOR is not just an organization of retirees anymore, we don't use our name. We only use our acronym now. It's not just for foreign service either. We're following the department's lead. We welcome our civil service colleagues, active duty and retired, as well as contractors and other professionals working across the foreign affairs agencies and the national security spectrum. If you're sitting in this room, by definition, you can be a member of DACOR. We especially hope that you will visit our house during its 200th anniversary year next year. Ambassador Tom Shannon has agreed to be our VIP uh, rainmaker for our uh, bicentennial, and you'll be hearing a lot more about it. Um, regarding the 100th anniversary of the Foreign Service, 
I want you to know we'll be having a public forum on June 20th, co-hosted with the George Washington University Elliott School about the past and future with the Foreign Service. You'll be invited to that as well. I'm standing here today because, you, as you just heard, in November 1965, the Department of State, AFSA, and DACOR organized the first Foreign Service Day to bring together career diplomats, journalists, academics, and business persons to discuss international matters of concern to the United States. DACOR awarded the first Foreign Service Cup to Lloyd Henderson three-time ambassador, undersecretary of state, and a founder of DACOR in 1967. With only a couple of missing years since then, we have been awarding the Foreign Service Cup on this day, now celebrated as Foreign Affairs Day, for about 60 years. After retiring from the Foreign Service and before coming to DACOR as a volunteer several years ago, I served for two years as the secretary of AFSA, and during my active duty years, I served on the AFSA board under the legendary late President Tex Harris. And so during my career with state and since then, I've had more than a passing interest in the intertwined history of DACOR and AFSA. It was DACOR, for example, that persuaded Congress to authorize pensions for retired Foreign Service personnel and benefits for their widows in the days before AFSA was a union or rep represented retirees. Prior to 1967, AFSA never testified before Congress. It left that work up to DACOR, which had been founded in 1952 as a 501c4 members organization precisely to advocate for the Foreign Service and particularly its right retirees and their dependents. The re why, you're saying, why do you know all this inside baseball? The reason I know some of this inside baseball is due to the person to whom we are awarding the Foreign Service Cup today. He's written all about it in several terrific books you've probably read. I should say that we choose the winner of the Foreign Service Cup from nominations from Dacorians uh, all over the world who send in the nominations. And the nominator for this awardee was Daniel Sewer, Sirwer, who wrote a terrific recommendation, and I just have done the copy and paste thing. Daniel Storer wrote to us in putting forth the name of his former boss, citing the awardee's, quote, exemplary, if relatively short, Foreign Service career, as well as his extraordinary efforts on behalf of American foreign policy in the almost 40 years since he has left the State Department. Dr. Serward goes on to describe how our awardee joined the Foreign Service in 1967 and rocketed to the Senior Foreign Service in 11 short years. The awardee served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Trade Policy in the Carter and Reagan administrations when the State Department was an important player on trade. His overseas posts included Warsaw, where he directed the U.S. Poland Trade Development Center and Brasilia, where he was deputy chief of mission during the successful transition from military to democratic rule. Among many other achievements, he quietly helped arrange a major treasury bailout when the Brazilians got into deep financial trouble. He received a presidential award for meritorious public service as well as numerous meritorious and superior honor awards from the department. As of today, our awardee has been out of the foreign service far longer than he was in it. Nevertheless, he has never stopped advocating for sensible U.S. foreign policy and for the U.S. Foreign Service. His three books on American diplomacy are unequaled. Career Diplomacy with Charles Gillespie, published by Georgetown University Press in 2008, Commercial Diplomacy and the National Interest, American Academy of Diplomacy, published in 2004, and Voice of the Foreign Service, a History of the American Foreign Service Association, published originally in 2015, and just like yesterday, the new edition is out. And I recommend it to you. It has a really great uh, new forward and some juicy details. Personally, I have my own worn copies of Career Diplomacy and the Voice of the Foreign Service on my reference shelf, and they're marked up and really worn and tattered. 
I occasionally refer to them as I did for this presentation. Um, again, I refer to you to the new book. You need to read the new book, the new book of the old book, the new version of the old book. And who exactly is this chronicler of American diplomats and their daring do? That superhero is the mild-mannered Harry Kopp. As the nominator wrote, Harry Kopp has made the institutions and people of the Foreign Service come alive, portraying their challenges and work carefully and accurately, but with sympathy and passion. It is likely that more applicants for the Foreign Service know what they are getting into from Harry's career diplomacy than any other book. U.S. Foreign Service has been fortunate in that Harry has spent most of his free time since leaving the service advocating for it. He wrote also a wonderful piece on the Descent Channel in the Foreign Service Journal in September 2017. I recommend that you, it's still very relevant. His concerted efforts over more than three decades merit appreciation and recognition. The Foreign Service Cup would be ideal as a tribute to someone who has never stopped trying to convince America that its diplomats are doing a necessary job well. That's what the nominator wrote to me, and I was convinced. So the draft cit citation, it may not be exactly as it is on the cup, so I'll go get the cup. And I will call up Harry. gave me clear instructions. Okay, Harry W. Cox, for his dedicated service to the Department of, let me read this, can't hear me maybe. To Harry Cox for his dedicated service to the Department of State as a Foreign Service Officer and his extraordinary efforts on behalf of American foreign policy in the almost 40 years since he left the department, working to convince Americans they can be proud of the way the nation dipl nation's diplomats are defending their country's vital interests. We're so proud to present that to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I will talk to you next time. Here we have Harry's name engraved on the bottom. Okay. Uh, going back to Lloyd Henderson in 67. Pretty interesting. Wow. I'll get my stuff up again. Thank you, Angela, and uh, thank you, Decor. Uh, thanks to Daniel Server, who nominated me. Uh, he was not only a Foreign Service colleague, he is a fellow alumnus of New Rochelle High School. Yes, and thanks to uh, John Nayland, who was the most careful reader of The Voice of the Foreign Service, the book that was released yesterday, and is immeasurably better for his... Uh, his efforts. And thanks to my wife, Jane, for her faith and patience and love. Uh, when I learned that Decor had chosen me to receive this award, three adjectives came to mind. I was astonished. I was astounded. And I was gobsmacked. Uh, I won't play the politician and say how humbled I am by this recognition, because I'm really kind of proud. And I, I'm not ashamed to say so. In a speech about 30 years ago, Chaz Freeman, Ambassador Chaz Freeman, said that diplomacy was a profession like law or medicine, and its practice should be restricted to those who are trained and properly credentialed. Now, I'm not so sure. When I look back on my career, I see that I learned how to be a diplomat by watching the great diplomats around me, some of whom you have probably heard of and many of whom I expect you have not. These are foreign service stars like uh, Walter Stessel, 
Tony Gillespie, Steve Bosworth, Eleanor Constable, Jock Shirley, civil servants like Jules Katz, Marjorie Steering, Dick Rivers, uh, political appointees like Bob Strauss and Tony Motley, my great friend Tony Motley. If diplomacy is a profession, and I agree that it is, it seems to me to be an open profession, like journalism, more like journalism, certainly, than, than like law or medicine. The skills and qualities that diplomacy requires can be acquired in different ways. And there's no single gatekeeper, uh, no board exam, no medical degree, nothing that excludes outsiders from uh, trying to enter the profession and then succeeding. I, th I think that's no bad thing. In the years after the Second World War, the uh, Hoover Commission on Organization of the Executive Branch worried about the division in the State Department between the civil service and the foreign service. The commission called this a cancerous cleavage. Yeah. For the next 30 years or so, reformers tried to find ways to close that cleavage. Uh, and then around the time of passage of the Foreign Service Act of 1980, that effort was abandoned. I think that was a mistake. We all know that the Foreign Service and uh, the whole idea of non-professional public service generally are under threat. We also know that a lot of recent efforts at reform have kind of fizzled out. But if I could fantasize, I'd like to see the next batch of reform efforts emerge from the civil service, as well as from members of the Foreign Service of all ranks and, and specialties. Uh, in union, there is strength. And maybe the cancerous cleavage can be healed at last. I did say fantasy. If I seem a little lost in the past, well, it's because my last day on active duty was nearly 40 years ago. But the Foreign Service has a powerful emotional hold on its members. And those of you who are retired know what I'm talking about. Those of you who are still on active duty will one day find out. We owe it to the country and we owe it to ourselves to do what we can to protect and perfect this, uh, this venerable and vulnerable and imperfect institution. I thank you all. Oh my goodness. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Angela, and congratulations, Harry Kopp. Those are inspiring words, and I think I speak for those of us who are active duty. We're already in love. One of the best honors of my job, <clears throat> excuse me, is recognizing the service of retired civil service and foreign service professionals whose careers have left a lasting mark on the department and on our nation. Today, I am very pleased to continue a longstanding Foreign Affairs Day tradition, the presentation of the Director General's Cups to celebrate two extraordinary public servants. First, it is my great pleasure to present the Director General's Civil Service Cup to a cherished colleague 
and yes, I confess, a friend, Susan Frost. Susan Frost joined the civil service as an eligible family member in 1998. She served in family member positions around the world, from Brasilia to Tijuana. In Washington, she worked in the Family Liaison Office, now the Global Community Liaison Office, managing the worldwide CLO program. She was also employed in the Office of Employee Relations, covering travel and leave policy, before returning to the Family Liaison Office, first as Deputy Director for five years, and then as its Director for six years. She retired from federal government employment in 2019 after a 21 year career and now volunteers at a local free clinic, sings with two choral groups, and of course, enjoys traveling. Susan is married to Gregory Frost, a retired FSO. They have three children and four grandchildren. As the CLO, Susan knew what it meant to attend to the entire community's needs, from family members to employees, with spouses, to single officers, to everyone. And she was their advocate. They needed a person who could truly understand the needs of the community and communicate those needs with suggested solutions to decision makers. After deftly clawing, and yes, it is a verb, at four posts, she went on to hold a variety of roles in the family liaison office, including, as I mentioned, six as the director. During her time at Flow, she led 30 four week long CLO or um, or orientations around the world, introducing 775 CLOs to the complexities of their um, complex and crucial seats at the country team and the ins and outs of these sensitive positions. It helped immensely that she doesn't suffer from jet lag. One of the most no drama leaders I've ever met, um, <clears throat> her colleagues and that her colleagues had the privilege to work for um, and with, Susan and her sharp empathetic flowsters guided mission chiefs, employees and family members through over 100 post evacuations not to mention a grueling 18-month hiring freeze where the promise of EFM employment was, for a time, broken. Susan, I think you were also the inventor of the big, hairy, audacious ideas exercise. If that's not true, if it was Leslie, then uh, Leslie, I apologize. But I sat in on a number of those um, brainstorming sessions where the goal was to think not just out of the box, but out of the room and to really come up with unique ideas. Um, and it was a tradition that I think caused Chloe to come up with some of the most innovative things that we've been able to institute um, uh, in GTM and, and HR before that. So I'd now like to invite Susan to join me on stage and ask that you all join me in a round of applause. Yeah, and let me read the citation first. Oh, brought the wrong glasses. Um, <clears throat> in recognition of, of more than two decades of distinguished service with the United States Department of State, including critical roles while serving uh, in <clears throat> essential family member positions in Lagos, Nigeria, Lyon, France, Mazaru uh, Lesotho, Tijuana, Mexico, Conakry, Guinea, Tegucigalpa, Honduras, Brasilia, Brazil, and Buenos Aires, Argentina, while serving in Washington in the Family Liaison Office, now the Global Community Liaison Office, 
management of the worldwide CLO program saw new vision. Your service in the Office of Employee Relations, um, <clears throat> overseeing travel and leave policy was extraordinary before returning to the Family Liaison Office as Deputy Director for five years and Director for six years. You brought vision and significant accomplishments to each program you undertook. And while doing so, you played a pivotal role in moving many of your colleagues forward through sound leadership and mentoring. Since your retirement from the federal government in 2019, you have used your volunteer work in free local clinics and choral groups as opportunities to inspire those interested in careers in foreign affairs and pub public service in general. Good morning. I'm truly honored and more than a little bit surprised to receive this year's Director General's Civil Service Cup. Thank you very much. And congratulations to the DG's Foreign Service Cup winner, Marie Ivanovich, and to the DACOR Cup winner, Harry Kopp. My civil service career was probably quite different from those of former recipients of this award. 49 years ago this month, my husband Greg became a Foreign Service Officer, and I became a dependent as family members were known in those days. At that time, there was very little orientation for family members, no Facebook groups where you could ask questions, and the Family Liaison Office, now the Global Community Liaison Office, I'm sorry, I have to trip over that a little bit, <laughs> didn't exist. We set off to our first post with very little idea of what to expect. Spoiler alert, it came out just fine. <laughs> Like all family members, I didn't have a, a consistent linear career. Every time we arrived at post, I would explore employment opportunities, eventually be hired, work for a while, and then go on to another post where I started all over again. The pattern continued throughout my husband's career, during which time I worked in every section of the embassy that employs family members, as well as for USAID. I was always grateful for the opportunity to contribute to our missions overseas, and learned so much from my colleagues, foreign service, locally employed staff, and other family members. I'm not sure I would have called it a career, but it certainly was very rewarding. My civil service career officially began in 1998 when I was hired as CLO under a family member appointment. This unique hiring mechanism offers a civil service appointment in the foreign service context and uh, enables family members, me included, to qualify for civil service retirement benefits and earn non-competitive eligibility into the, civil the career civil service. It was a total game changer that changed my career and has continued to change to benefit family members ever since. I'm eternally grateful for the creativity, hard work, and persistence of supporters of family member employment throughout the State Department, most particularly in the Family Liaison Office. 2005 was a pivotal moment in my career. My husband was preparing to retire, and I distinctly remember him saying to me, what would you like to do after having followed me around for 30 years? <laughs> that was not a question I'd ever considered, but I've tried to figure out an answer. Um, while I was pursuing the process of becoming an office management specialist in the Foreign Service, Family Liaison ad Office advertised their CLO program position, very attractive to me as a three-time former CLO. I ended up with a conditional offer as an OMS and a job offer from FLO. Instead of continuing our Foreign Service lifestyle, I chose to join FLO. What a great decision that turned out to be. FLO is a unique place to work. And I'm sure the name change to Global Community Liaison Office hasn't changed the culture. Everyone working there has a common background as a family member overseas, which leads to a cohesive and collaborative group of creative and hardworking employees dedicated to the mission of the office. I'm honored to have been part of the office 
and very proud of the work we accomplished there. As I reflect on my career, it never ceases to amaze me that I was able to stitch together a disparate and disjointed series of family member positions into a consistent and personally satisfying career. When I look back, I don't think about programs and policies, taskers, action memos, countless meetings. No, I think of the people, the professional relationships I had with colleagues and the conversations, however short, with family members and employees. Together, we accomplished a lot, and I thank them for being part of my civil service journey. Thank you very much. Marie Yovanovitch, also known to her colleagues and friends as Masha, is the author of a best-selling memoir, Lessons from the Edge. She is a distinguished fellow at Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs, a non-resident fellow at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy uh, at Georgetown University, and a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. During her 33-year diplomatic career, she served as U.S. Ambassador to Kyrgyzstan, Armenia, and Ukraine. She also worked in Russia, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Somalia, and in multiple ass assignments in Washington, including as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs, where she coordinated policy on European and global security issues. Masha modeled that unflappable calm that is so much more powerful than a raised voice. She disproved the conventional wisdom that one needs sharp elbows to be influential and successful in the Foreign Service. But even more, she cared deeply about everyone on her team. Countless times, she would ask about someone's personal crisis, a sick parent, other examples. Her big brain is matched only by her big heart. Her colleagues have said that they are more strategic, humble, and intrepid because of her, and they often ask themselves, what would Masha do? Masha answered that question on the world stage in ways none of us could have imagined. And she did it with grace, integrity, and courage. Thank you, Masha. Ambassador Yovanovitch couldn't be with us today, and so we offer our congratulations virtually. And uh, But she also left us with some pre-recorded remarks. Thanks to everyone who has joined us for this special day, Foreign Affairs Day. I wish I was with you because there is nothing like being with our extended State Department family, especially on the day that we are marking the 100th anniversary of the Foreign Service. It is a great opportunity to celebrate our important mission and the sense of purpose that binds us. I strongly believe that those of us who choose this career, this life, make a difference every single day. And I remain grateful for the many opportunities that I have had to do so over the course of my career. There is nothing more gratifying than working for the American people and helping to make the United States and the world more democratic, more prosperous, and more secure. At the beginning of my career, we were congratulating ourselves that the ideals of democracy and the promise of capitalism had vanquished the tyranny and failures of communism. The Cold War was over and we could bank the peace dividend. 
30 years on, it doesn't feel like the end of history, as some had promised. It feels like we now have not just the nation-state challenges of old, but the new challenges of terrorism post 9-11, pandemics, global warming, the often disorienting and dangerous effects of technology, and the tension between a globalizing world and a trending nativism, to name just a few. At the same time, our nation is divided. Our adversaries are uniting against us. Our allies are hedging. New powers are rising. And international institutions are unfit for purpose and under severe strain. No agency is better suited to meet this moment than the State Department and its dedicated diplomats. The quiet work of diplomacy can be, and often is, more effective and less resource intensive than just about any other tool in the U.S. toolbox. As we work to get our policies and our practice right for the times, we also need to strengthen the department. We need to take on the mantle of leadership in foreign affairs, intellectually through our vision for the future, and practically within the interagency to shape better outcomes for an uncertain world. To do that, we need more resources, clearly. But we also need to change our culture. We need to take risks, experiment, innovate, and have the courage of our convictions. We need to get out of our individual silos and build a broad-based knowledge culture, one that learns from the past, both our successes and our failures, and seeks opportunities to continuously learn and is rewarded for it. We need to grow the national security leaders of tomorrow. These volatile times with old threats and new challenges require no less. I know there is a lot of work being done in these areas and that Director General Bernicat is one of the leaders of this effort. So I thank you, Marcia, for the work that you and your team are doing to reanimate the department. I am optimistic about the United States and the future of diplomacy. And that's because I know many of the up and coming stars of the department. And I know them to be full of smarts and importantly, full of idealism and integrity. I also spend quality time on university campuses around the country and meet with the bright students who are coming up behind them. They are eager to jump into the arena and fix the world. The next gen gives me hope for the next 100 years of American diplomacy. In closing, I'd like to thank the DG for the unexpected honor of the Director General's Cup for the Foreign Service, especially when I see the list of previous honorees, giants of the Foreign Service, some of them people that I had the good fortune to work for. I am being recognized today because of them, because of their guidance and mentorship, but also because of the support and dedication of so many colleagues and friends as well as the hard work and patience of, of those that I have supervised. This truly is a shared honor that I'm so pleased to accept on behalf of our Foreign Service family. Thank you and happy birthday. And now, I would like to invite Kyle Logton, the Executive Director of the Senior Living Foundation, to make a few remarks. Thank you very much, and congratulations to Harry, Susan, and Marie. As we mark the 100th anniversary of the Rogers Act, the 100th anniversary of AFSA, it also reminds me that last year, the Senior Living Foundation marked our own milestone of 35 years serving the Foreign Service community, the Foreign Service family. That was a time we had to reflect on our history, and it was a time of great gratitude to the people in this room, to those watching at home, and to so many others. The Senior Living Foundation was an idea born of those in the Foreign Service who looked around and asked a question, how can I help those in need? And like so many questions that come up, it was answered by the Foreign Service. We can do this. And over the years, this group, the Foreign Service family has provided more than $20 million in support to their colleagues in need. That need takes a lot of different forms. 
In some cases, it's a former spouse who's not only struggling with grief and a change in life, but also struggling to make ends meet. It could be a recent widow who has their own form of grief and in the midst of trying to bury a loved one, they're also trying to keep the bills paid while waiting for their own survivor annuity. It could be an active duty officer these days who gets a call in the middle of the night that their parent has suffered a medical emergency and they've got to figure out how to coordinate care for that parent from thousands of miles away. It also could be very simply a retiree, a couple, an individual planning for the next stage of their lives and seeking professional guidance. In each of those situations and in so many more ways, the Senior Living Foundation answers the call. And it is because of your generosity, your giving, that we are able to support one another. I want to close with one story that exemplifies the work that you enable us to do. In the early days of the pandemic, the summer of 2020, I received a call from a foreign service widow who had been living on her own for almost 30 years. She had a very small pent survivor's annuity. She had a very small social security payment that came in each month from her own work where she was scraping a living together on less than $1,200 a month. And even in the midst of that, she'd managed to pay off her home, her car, and was, was almost making ends meet, but her roof was leaking. She had termites coming into her low-income home. She needed help. She reached out. We were able to answer that call. Not only were we able to provide and still today provide an ongoing support on a monthly basis to make her life just a little bit easier, we also are able to provide home health care now as, her, as, as aging is catching up with her physically and care management services so that she can reach medical services and other needed support uh, in her area. That's because of you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your ongoing support and happy Foreign Affairs Day. Thank you, Kyle, for the extraordinary work that the foundation is doing to assist the foreign service community, especially with their elder care needs, but so much more broadly. It is now my distinct privilege to introduce the fifth Deputy Secretary for Management and Resources, Richard Verma. Deputy Secretary Verma assumed office on April 4th, 2023. He brings over 25 years of international experience across senior levels of business, law, diplomacy, and the military. And he is no stranger to the department. During the Obama administration, Deputy Secretary Verma served as the US ambassador to India, where he led one of the largest US dipl diplomatic missions and championed historic progress in bilateral cooperation on defense, trade, and clean energy with one of our oldest, but also challenging friends. He also served as the unofficial dean among those of us who served as ambassadors in the region alongside him. Prior to that, he was Assistant Secretary of State for Legislative Affairs at the department. And he also worked on Capitol Hill as the National Security Advisor to the Senate Majority Leader. Deputy Secretary Verma holds multiple degrees, including a PhD from Georgetown University and a law degree from American University. And I also want to emphasize that so many of the reforms that we have been enacting have been with his guidance, with his blessing, and yes, with his pushing. And we are so grateful to have champions like the secretary, like Deputy Secretary Verma, giving us the impetus, um, the drive, the permission, and also um, the inspiration to make the changes that we've been able to make. Deputy Secretary Verma. Thank you. Morning, everybody. 
really, really great to be here. I want to thank the Director General. Thank you to AFSA, DECOR, Senior Living Foundation, represented here by Tom, by Angela, by Kyle, for your leadership and for putting this event together uh, each year. As you've already heard, today's event has a special significance because we're celebrating the 59th annual Foreign Affairs Day and the centennial of the Foreign Service in AFSA. Now, I'm told this means the program will focus on the past 100 years and the way ahead. And I thought this sounded, frankly, awfully ambitious for a one-day program. But then I recalled that most of you can summarize the root causes of a foreign civil war in a five-paragraph table with 50 subtitles. So I expect you'll be finished by lunch, uh, which is good because we are fortunate to have our uh, ambassador to the United Nations, uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, to be our uh, luncheon speaker. So I'm really grateful for her coming down to join us. Uh, again, I'd like to thank the Director General and her team at GTM, particularly longtime coordinators Shalia Moyer and Shirley Lizenby. It is because of their hard work at that the program has now returned to its full form after a long COVID break. So thank you to, to both Shalia and Shirley. Fine. <laughs> Let me also join the others in congratulating today's award winners and thanking all of you, every person here, for your excellence and for your dedicated service to the United States. I also want to congratulate the 15 Foreign Service officers that were confirmed by the U.S. Senate last night. Uh, <laughs> something that does not happen enough. Uh, <laughs> these days, but uh, Tom and so many others have, have really worked on this, and we need to get back to regular order in the Senate where our, our folks get out into the field. As we are highlighting this month, the seeds of today's diplomatic workforce were planted 100 years ago on May 24th. It was on that day that the Rogers Act was signed into law, reforming U.S. diplomacy by establishing a career diplomatic corps based on competitive examination and merit promotion. It is unquestionable that Mr. Rogers' vision for a foreign service fit to serve the department's diplomatic purpose was a success. In the intervening 100 years, our, term, our team of foreign affairs professionals has grown from 633 foreign service officers 100 years ago to a diverse group of almost 80,000 foreign and civil service employees, locally employed staff, eligible family members, the contracted workforce, student interns, and others. Now, there are many moments we could look at when we consider this tremendous 100-year evolution, but I want to focus on just two points in time during my remarks. The first is 23 years ago, when Secretary Powell took steps that continue to resonate throughout the organization. Speaking on Foreign Affairs Day in 2001, Secretary Powell announced the decision to change the name of the day's celebration from one focused exclusively on the Foreign Service to a more inclusive Foreign Affairs Day. As Secretary Powell put it, it was time for the department to use this day to, quote, embrace the entire family, everyone who has made a contribution to American diplomacy, everyone who has contributed some way or another to the greatness of this department. Secretary Powell then went on to summarize the organizational challenges for the department at the time. He argued for staffing up the department for a changing world fighting for resources, engaging better with the Hill, leadership training and a training float, more equity between the different parts of the workforce, equipping the department with the emerging technology of the day. Sounds rather familiar. In, indeed, this was the famous speech where Secretary Powell promised that, quote, I want every single employee in the Department of State 
to have access to the internet on his or her desk. Now, back then, the audience cheered. Today, I think it's fair to say, as we look at our inboxes, we might wonder whether this was a good idea or not. But what really resonates in that speech is how many of these, of the needs then, are things we are still working on now. And I don't see that as a fault, but rather a reminder from the past that it is inevitable that an agency tasked with engaging an ever-changing world must itself also be willing to embrace change and to modernize. And as I'll discuss in a few minutes, we are doing just that. Another notable fact about these remarks by Secretary Powell was the day they were delivered, September 10th, 2001. Approximately 10 years before Secretary Powell gave that speech, we were at the end of the Cold War, an inflection point that brought about an era of unilateral American leadership. The department pivoted quickly to engage with the former Soviet states and it changed Russia. I'm sure many of you even worked through those problem sets. By 2001, the strategic thinking Secretary Powell was looking ahead and seeing the department needed to modernize and adapt to this changed world. And then the day after his speech, the world changed yet again. And it would keep changing in momentous ways for the next 23 years. 9-11, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Arab Spring, technological revolution, social media, disinformation, the pandemic, new challenges from Putin, and concerns about China's intent. October 7th, I could go on. But Secretary Powell and his successors still managed to see many of his workforce reforms through. And this department, this workforce, in turn, met the demands of the day every time with resilience, with creativity and effort that delivered for the American people. One way Secretary Powell's legacy continues to resonate through the department is through our determination to bring new voices into our ranks, including by expanding our fellowship programs. These new offerings include the Colin Powell Leadership Development Program. It's a fitting name and a fitting program to honor the legacy of a dedicated soldier and statesman that fundamentally changed the department through his focus on workforce and organizational leadership. So let's turn to where we are now, the second of two eras I wanted to talk about. Some of you might have been here last year and recall that I spoke at the close of last year's conference. I think I was in the job for about one month and we were in the midst of a crisis in Sudan. The whirlwind that started then has never really stopped. Over the past year or so, I've traveled to over 40 countries and a half dozen states, visiting our overseas and domestic missions and spending time with our workforce. People have been asking me, why are you traveling so much? Isn't your job here in DC? I can assure you I've had plenty of meetings here too. But I also think it's critically important to stay connected to the needs of our workforce, including our terrific locally employed staff. Now, there's a few reasons for this. As a former ambassador, I know, as will many of you that have worked overseas, how there can sometimes be a disconnect between the field and Washington. We talk a lot about building shared understanding with foreign governments. I think it's important to make sure we have that shared understanding between headquarters and our globally deployed workforce. I also come back from every trip inspired and motivated to do the right thing by our team spread across the globe. What you will find when you travel is that our teams around the world are as committed and dedicated a workforce as you will find, and that includes those that are serving in very dangerous and difficult conditions. At the end of the day, we are a national security agency. 
with people serving bravely from Ukraine to Somalia and South Sudan to Iraq and Port-au-Prince and in so many other conflict zones across the world. I could share many stories of their creativity and effectiveness and heroism, but the main point here is this. In an age of increased competition, of global interconnectedness, of growing authoritarianism, it is vitally important for America's diplomats and development professionals to show up everywhere we can to lead, to build, to grow, and to deepen cooperation. This mission is so important because, as Secretary Blinken often says, the world does not organize itself. Without U.S. leadership, there are often adverse consequences. And that is why the United States has worked over the generations to build an unrivaled network of global friendships, partnerships, and alliances to work with together towards our common causes. And it is this network that is the United States' greatest strategic asset. And our ability to continue to lead is so important because the world is always changing, including becoming more complex and some would argue less free. And it is on the shoulders of this department to keep that network strong and growing. Our diplomatic mission is also more important than ever as we see more countries competing for more resources with a more fractured international architecture involving renewed great power competition and a wide range of transnational threats. It was in this context, even before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the attacks of October 7th, or the latest instability in Haiti or parts of Africa that President Biden suggested, the world is at another inflection point a point where the decisions America makes now at home and abroad will impact generations to come. These decisions, of course, include how we approach our competition with the People's Republic of China or respond to Putin. There are also decisions about how we handle cybersecurity attacks and information warfare, how we push back the continuing threat of extremist groups, how we prepare for the next pandemic, address the impacts of climate change, or integrate artificial intelligence into human endeavor. So how are we addressing all of these challenges? The first way is by, again, focusing on ensuring the department is fit for diplomatic purpose in this changing world. Under Secretary Blinken's modernization agenda, we are making sure this department continues to adapt, evolve, and lead on the global stage, leveraging the advantages of our diverse society and driven by the promise of a dynamic future. Since the modernization was agen agenda was announced over two years ago, major organizational changes have reflected evolving missions, such as the creation of a new China house, launching of the Bureau of Cyberspace and Digital Policy and the Global Health Security and Diplomacy Bureau, appointing our first Chief Diversity and Inclusion, Inclusion Officer and the launch of the agency's first DEIA strategic plan and major IT reform. Each of these steps is helping the department to ensure we have the organizational capabilities necessary to address what we see before us today and into the foreseeable future. But of course, we also know that much of what we will face will be unforeseeable. Imagine when Secretary Powell made that great speech 23 years ago, he had no idea how much the world would change the very next day. But the leadership lesson we learned from that speech is just as valid now as it was then. If we want to be able to address the knowns and unknowns, we have to invest in our people. And that's why the workforce reform is the second big prong of the modernization agenda and a place where we are making tremendous strides. And let me just outline a couple of those areas before I wrap up. Our mantra is that we want to recruit, train, and retain the world's foremost diplomatic corps. We've made 
incentive structure for the Foreign Service more competitive. We're looking at civil service mobility. We're doing more surveys and feedback from our workforce. On recruitment, we are focused on making it easier for the department to win the competition for the kind of talent and diverse talent we need to succeed. As Secretary Blinken has noted, diversity and inclusion makes us stronger, smarter, more creative and innovative and gives us significant competitive advantage on the world stage. We're doing more than ever to seize on that advantage. In the last year alone, our 17 diplomats and residents and national recruiters have conducted thousands of in-person career events in all 50 states, as well as Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands, providing guidance and advice to students, professionals, and the community about department careers and student programs. We also launched paid internships, removing financial barriers to allow the brightest students from colleges and universities across our great nation to live and work in Washington, D.C. at U.S. embassies and consulates overseas. We're also excited to be transitioning Foreign Service assessments to virtual platform. This is in keeping with the trend in the private sector, but also makes application to the Foreign Service more accessible to all. So we're trying to go out and find people who ordinarily would not have had a pathway to this department. That means all 50 states, all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of educational and career experiences. We are expanding our training options, encouraging career law and professional development with new classes, curriculum, flexibility, and finally, yes, that training float that Secretary Powell mentioned 23 years ago. We also have several retention initiatives, but the one I want to highlight is broader than one single program. Rather, it is an organization-wide focus on making sure our ranks at all levels more closely reflect the diversity of our great country. This includes equity, inclusion, and transparency initiatives that are more consistent with our organization's values. We are far from finished leveling the playing field, but these are measurable and important steps forward. So these are just some of the recent progress and successes that we've had, and we are keeping our organization prepared for the tasks ahead. And we are not done. We are asking everyone in the organization for new ideas about where we can improve. And I'd like to ask all of you for your help as well. Yes, your service is not over. We need you to help us to continue to recruit the best and the brightest recruits for our organization. And I'm not just talking about international relations majors. The breadth of our international cooperation is so broad now that our needs include nearly every field of endeavor from computer scientists working on artificial intelligence to life scientists working on global health security diplomacy. If you know someone interested in a foreign affairs career, send them to careers.state.gov to get more information. If you'll take that one request on board, perhaps all of us, retirees, current employees, fellows, and future employees might look back on this time, this inflection point, 23 years from now, and decide our organizational introspection was well suited to the time, that we got more right than wrong, and that we worked together to prepare the department as well as we could to be the face of America to a changing world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Deputy Secretary Verma. You mentioned we're going to, I'm going to talk in a moment about the, my colleagues in GTM who did all of the hard work to organize this event and to bring you here. But um, we have a special presentation from Jason Richardson. Jason, where are you? Uh, wonderful. Jason is a GSO within GTM's EX 
uh, General Services Division and a rising influencer whose idea became a reality in the form of a challenge coin to capture the essence of this momentous centennial celebration. I have to tell you, Jason did this completely on his own, very much inspired, and he worked with our state magazine team to design a two-faced coin that is really extraordinary. And we want you, sir, to have the first one. <laughs> We are, we are, thank you. So um, before, quickly, I ask uh, the audience to stand so that we can do a photo op with the deputy secretary um, and myself. Um, I wish to take a moment to recognize our Foreign Affairs Day lead coordinators who have organized an outstanding program for us today and by popular demand brought back the discussion panels, the luncheon and the continental breakfast this year. So yes, we, we listen. So please join me in a round of applause for Shirley Lisenby, Shalea Moyer, and Jennifer Eckert. Ladies, no, 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 you have to come up here on the stage. I'm sorry, you gotta come up on the stage. And <laughs> in addition to Shirley, Shalea, and Jennifer, um, Adrian Dorman, who this is her last day as my OMS in the uh, GTM front office. She wouldn't leave until this event was a wrap. And then finally, Patty Hoffman, who is our, um, our EX director for GTM. She has one of the hardest jobs in the building, moving 9,000 people roughly a year in and out of posts and, and Washington, DC, among many other things. And the Foreign Affairs Committee, um, because these ladies, I understand, are not going to be with us forever. And they want to make sure in the best tradition of the, the Foreign Service and the State Department um, that they are uh, have an apprenticeship for the next generation of organizers. Ladies, thank you so much. And then just a quick reminder that um, the panel discussions that the Deputy Secretary mentioned will start today at 1130 in the Dean and the Loy Auditoriums. Both panels will discuss the department's progress and its future. Um, please remember as well, mark your calendars now for next year's Foreign Affairs Day on Friday, May 2nd. Until then, follow us on state.gov and careers.state.gov to stay abreast of what the department is achieving and the opportunities, the ever expanding opportunities available to Americans interested in serving in this important way. Thank you all for joining us today and um, following the photo. I invite you to stay in this room um, and stay seated to watch the AFSA Memorial Wall Ceremony um, here uh, in the Dean Atchison Auditorium. Thank you so much. <laughs>